church? Wow, what a powerful time of worship. Would you just give God praise? He is worthy. My goodness. Thank you, Lisa, for leading us in that time of prayer. Just so thankful God's already at work in our midst. Take your copy of God's Word. You're going to turn near the very end of the book. There are three letters. Sometimes we call them epistles, little letters written by one of the disciples, John. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We're looking at 1 John. We're going to be in chapter 2 as we continue this series that we've called Heading Home. It's Christmas. Do you have a, a favorite Christmas story or a favorite Christmas movie? Maybe you like uh, Elf or... Uh, Maybe you like that well-known Christmas movie, Die Hard. Or, uh... Now, I think an easy one that we could probably agree on is Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. How many of you have either read or seen or heard A Christmas Carol? You know the story. It really revolves around one man. His name is Ebenezer Ebenezer Scrooge. I mean, what a powerful story, by the way, that a character in the story could become a descriptor of stingy and greedy and miserable people. And so Ebenezer Scrooge is a miserable man who has this gift of making everybody around him miserable. And maybe we all can relate to those kind of people in our lives, that they lack peace and so as a result, no one around them has peace. Now, I've lived long enough to know that though this is a terrible place to be, it's an area where a lot of folks hang out, just living a life of misery. There's a lot of people in our world that seem to lack peace. What causes you to lack peace? Well, there's some big things. When you have grief in your life, you've, someone that you loved has died, man, that can rob you of peace. Really loss of any kind, right? When you lose a job or, or you lose some financial standing, that can cause you to lack peace. Depression or discouragement and robs us of peace. Disappointment and sinful choices. Man, I've made some sinful choices in my life and as a result, I've, I've lacked peace. The lack of peace is everywhere. I spent a lot of years laughing at the comedy, the humor of Robin Williams, but before he committed suicide at age 63, Robin Williams said this, I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, only turmoil. Why is there such a struggle for peace? Well, according to Scripture, there's a pretty straightforward answer to that. Anytime there's a lack of peace, ultimately, it's either a direct or indirect result of sin in this world. And yet, we gather together as the church of a living God to worship one who is called the Prince of Peace. We're here to worship Jesus. And yet, I have to tell you, I've been in church all my life, and yet even at church, it seems like there's a pandemic of peacelessness. So what do we do? How do we find peace in a peaceless world? Where's the peace? In Isaiah 26.3, the prophet says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. On Thursday evening, I watched a couple of our people in our church just have a hilltop moment. Now, what's a hilltop moment? I, I want you to start thinking about that phrase because the reality as a church, we're just a bunch of broken people, right? On our own, we have messed up lives, but together we're creating God's mosaic in Jesus Christ. And, and so here, but then really when we leave here, we meet needs, we heal hurts, we speak God's word everywhere we go, everywhere, every day. And those everyday moments become hilltop moments for you mission healers. They become an opportunity for you to be on mission right where you live, work, and play. And, and so my friend Linda Umford, I got to know her about 13 years ago, and, and, and she came to this church not for 
a weekend service, but for an event that she kind of oversaw. It was for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It was a vigil that she'd been involved in now for almost 40 years because her sister lost her life to a drunk or impaired driver. And so as we got to know Linda those first couple of years, she eventually committed her life to Christ, and her and Carl began to get involved in this church. But she's still really involved in this Mothers Against Drunk Driving vigil that takes place around Christmas time every year. And so Thursday night, not a church event. Our church just hosted it. We kind of were the place. Um, These seats were filled with people whose lives had been impacted because somebody they loved died because of a drunk or impaired driver. And, And so much of these seats were filled with hundreds and hundreds of Tampa Tampa Bay law enforcement from all the different counties and all the different agencies. And I was so proud because Linda was just using that special calling on her life to reach out and make a a difference in other people's lives. You, You have a calling like that, by the way. That's part of what will bring you peace when you discover that special calling that God wants for you. But there was somebody else there also exercising their special calling. You, you just saw her. She's one of my favorites. It's one of our young adults, college student named Cassie Adams. And Cassie, at the end of that time on Thursday night, Linda had asked her to sing for all the group gathered. And, and she sang this song. You've probably heard these words. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. That, that's what I want for you today, all right? So just so you know where we're standing and, and we're on level ground, I, I want you to walk away with the peace that was meant to be, not the chaos, not the stress, not the anxiety of your life, but the peace that was meant to be. Bart Ehrlman, the famous agnostic scholar, he's a professor at UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina. He was asked some time back, what would it take for you to believe in Jesus? And this was his answer. If Jesus had fulfilled his promise to bring peace on earth, then I would believe in him. I want to tell you today that that I believe Jesus has fulfilled that promise. And I want you to see how you can have that peace That was meant to be. Here's the premise. Ultimately, all of the lack of peace that we have in life is due to a broken relationship with Jesus. And the only way to get that right is to fix our relationship with Jesus. So I want to pray one more time and just ask the Prince of Peace to meet us here personally, okay? So Father, in the name of Jesus, that's our simple prayer today. Manifest your peace in our lives. God, I would pray that you overcome and overwhelm everything in us and around us that is robbing us of peace. Whether that be spiritually or whether that be circumstantially. God, as we read your word, as we look throughout the scriptures and And just a reminder that your word is truth. I pray that you would give us those things we need that we've we've not yet obtained. That you would teach us new truth that, Lord, maybe we've not absorbed. And and that you would change us. That we would become different and more like you because we are here. Would you give us peace? Would you do this for your glory and for our good? And would you do this in the name of Jesus? the Prince of Peace. All God's people said, Amen. First John, we're in chapter 2, we're just looking at two verses. First John chapter 2, in just a moment, verses 1 and 2. Now the second chapter of John is going to tell us how to have peace. The first chapter of John, we just looked at the first couple of verses there, and it taught us how to have joy. And in, in fact, John said, this is a way that you can have complete joy. Now, this is one of those easy questions. It's a softball question, so get ready, get teed up, okay? How did John tell us that we could have joy? How do we have joy? Yes, yeah, it's through Jesus. How do you think we're going to have peace? Yeah, yeah this is simple. Uh, really, it is. And and some of you, you you make this faith journey harder than it is. There's a lot of times in life where 
really our life could be transformed if we would just take a step back and just breathe in who Jesus is and all that that means. He's the one who gives us peace. So let's start chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. We're just going to get one phrase deep. Here it is. My dear children. John, the brother of James, James and John, the disciples, remember them? They were kind of funny guys, you know. Their mom came to Jesus and said, hey, can my two boys sit on your left and right? Come on, Jesus. I'm a parent of five. I understand kind of trying to step in for the kiddos. And so that's what happened. I mean, James and John, John was one of the younger disciples, but now he's, who knows, 85, 90 years old. It's about 85, 90 AD. He's near the end of his life, an elder in the church. And so part of what he's doing is what Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 17 says is going to be expected of all people like me, leaders, elders in the church, those who shepherd the flock of God. We're going to be accountable for how we lead, the things we say, what what we do. So John understood that. But I think there's more. And looking out at the hair color that some of us share or the lack of hair that some of you have, I think the reality is there's more of us who fall into this category. You're elders in the faith. You've been at this a while. It's no longer okay that you're just kind of going through the motions. You're just sitting and soaking it in. You, you are to take that fatherly, motherly role in the body of Christ You're to be reaching behind you, just like Paul did with young Timothy, and and to bring others along. It's a term of endearment, my dear children. I I write this to you so that you will not sin. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. Hey, what if I began the message every weekend by saying, okay, everybody listen up. The things we're going to talk about, here's the reason we're talking about them, so that you won't sin. And on some level, I suppose that's true, but it, that's an audacious claim, right? We, we go back to 1 John chapter 1. Now, we started by saying that our joy is complete when we experience Jesus and when we express Jesus, and we kind of looked at the last part of that chapter dealt with what happens when sin is not dealt with in our life. John was saying, hey, some of you say you've got Jesus, but... Your life doesn't look like you're walking in the light. It looks like you're walking in the darkness. And if your life always looks like you're walking in the darkness, but you say you have light, the light's not in you. You're just a liar. You're deceiving yourself. What was he saying? When you begin a relationship with Christ, things change in your life. You don't sin the way you used to sin. John was addressing both doctrinal problems, people that didn't believe right, and behavioral problems, people who didn't behave right. He was saying, when when you follow Christ, things change. You don't become sinless, but you are supposed to sin less. Did you get that? We're not sinless, but we as Christ followers are supposed to sin less. And that's a problem in the church today. There's reasons for the problem. Some, it's because we've not taken seriously that call to follow Christ. Some is because people have never repented of their sinfulness. They've, they've never turned from the old way of life. Some is just because we've embraced the sins of this world. Rather than pursuing holiness and repenting of sin, we accommodate and sometimes accept sin. Instead of what I grew up learning, which is we hate sin and love the sinner, we felt like we've got to embrace the sin in an effort to express our love to the sinner. And that's not the way it should be. So he says, I've written these things to you so that you will not sin. But then he says what we know is coming. But if anyone does sin. Do you see that? But if anyone does sin. In other words, when we do sin, right? You're going to sin. You're going to fall short. When we do, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, I love how I've structured this message because it's really a one, two, three punch. You ready? I've got one big idea, two theological truths, and then three everyday applications. The one big idea is this. The peace of God is only possible through peace with God. 
And that's only possible through a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's elementary, but let me say it again so that you get it. The peace of God, which is something that a lot of people are lacking. They're not walking with the peace of God. The peace of God is only possible through peace with God. The Bible says when you're born, you're you're born at war with God. That's something we don't understand because we don't like to talk about sin. My friend Linda, I just referred to you after maybe that second year at the Mad Visual, she came to me and said, Pastor, I've got somebody upset. I said, why are they upset? And this lady said she didn't like it because you stood up and said that we're all sinners. I'm like, okay. I got bad news for her. (laughs) We're all sinners. We all are born in this setting where we're at war. The Bible calls it enmity. We're enemies of God. And until that's dealt with, we don't have peace with God. And until we have peace with God, we won't have the peace of God. The only way that's dealt with is through Jesus Christ. And that's what John describes in a very simple, straightforward idea. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the sovereign over peace in your life. He's the only way you're going to know peace. So whatever's causing that peace absence in your life, whether it's sinful choices or whether it's a grieving season or, or whether it's loss of some other kind or whether it's just depression and discouragement, the only ultimate answer that truly can bring living peace is the living prince of peace. Isaiah talked about him in Isaiah 9, 6. For he says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, listen to these descriptors, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and say it, church, the prince of peace. So how does the prince of peace bring us peace? Well, that's the two theological truths, and really this gets back to what theologically we call our soteriology. Say soteriology. That's made up of two words, soteria, which literally speaks to our salvation. The the end of that speaks to our knowledge, logic, knowledge. And so it's our knowledge about how we're saved. That shouldn't be foreign to those of you that have hung out for a year or two here because we spent about 30 weeks in the book of Romans. And all through Romans, we talked about how we are saved, what it means to be saved. What John is saying is that you can know that you're saved. That's a good thing, church. You don't have to live in doubt. You don't have to live wondering. That would rob you of peace if you, if you just lived your life wondering if I'm going to go to heaven. That is not the scriptural way of the follower of Christ. The scriptural way of the follower of Christ is confidence in your eternal security. We're going to deal with that the last Sunday of this year in the fifth chapter of this book because John is going to say these things are written so that, say so that, so that you can know you have eternal life. The whole purpose of the scriptures is so that you can have confidence. In, in the gospel of John, John's writing that to convert sinners to Christ. In these three letters, John's writing to confirm the saints, to, to help you know, hey, you are on the right path. You are headed home. Aren't you thankful for that truth? This world is not our own. C.S. Lewis said, if you find yourself longing for something that this world cannot feel, it's because you were created for another place. I'm thankful that that I'm heading home. I'm I'm thankful that one day, I don't know the day, but that one day I'm going to be looking not through a glass dimly, but I'm going to be seeing my Jesus face to face. I'm so thankful for the confidence that comes from knowing I'm heading home. And so he takes his whole little letter, these five chapters, and he says, first, head home with joy. And now he's saying, head home with peace. And next week, we're going to talk about heading home with hope. And then Christmas Eve, we're going to talk about heading home with love. And then then it ends by saying, heading home because you have life. Now, how do we do that? How do we live with that kind of confidence in our salvation, our soteriology, what we know about how we're saved? That's the two theological truths. Number one, Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our advocate. What does that word mean? You could think of it as helper. I like to think of it as attorney. Let me see if I can help you out here. Jesus is your Morgan and Morgan. You got it? (laughs) Jesus is the one who's going to step in 
and stand on your behalf and speak for you. Now, here's a question. Why do we need an advocate? Yeah, because we're guilty. This is hard because I know you, you come and you want to feel good today, but let me just kind of take us down a path before we get up to the mountain. Um, say this. Just say, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Yeah, we are. Remember, that's what the Bible says. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's design, his, his glorious mark, his bullseye. We've missed it. And so we're guilty. And unless we want to take the punishment of our guilt, which the Bible says is death, the wages of sin is death, unless we want to take that punishment, we need somebody to stand in on our behalf and argue our case. Sin's a big deal. I, I like to smile a lot. I, I like you to see my blue eyes, and I like to tell funny stories, and it encourages me when you're encouraged, but, but I need you to understand in, in this church, we're going to constantly remind you that sin is a big deal because it separates you from God and it, it keeps you from the fellowship that he designed and, and you miss out on his best and it, it robs you of peace and we're all sinners. And that's been the way it was since the garden. Now in the garden, things started out good in the garden. In the garden, God created Adam and Eve and it was great and then they had everything going for them and they had not sinned yet, but it was possible to sin. You know how I know it was possible to sin? Because God said, hey, you can do anything you want to do except this. Don't do this thing over here. And what did they do? That thing. And so sin entered the world. And ever since the garden, before the cross, it was not possible not to sin. And so God created this sacrificial system. So when you blew it, some animal is going to have to die, and that shed blood is going to have to cover your sinfulness so that God has been paid back because you have broken that relationship with him. That's the way it was up until Jesus. But after the cross, Jesus became the Lamb of God. Jesus became the living sacrifice for your sin and my sin. And so after the cross and the resurrection, now all of a sudden we're in this new existence. Theoretically, say theoretically. That means it could be, it's possible not to sin. It's hard for us to imagine because we got this sin nature in us. But it's possible not to sin. But what happens? That's what John said. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But <laughs> when you do, here's what you have. You have this advocate. Now, by the way, we're heading home, right? What's going to take place in heaven? It's not possible to sin. Remember where it started? It's, it's possible not to sin. It's not possible not to sin. It's possible to not sin. And then in heaven, it's not possible to sin. If it's true how I started, that our biggest problems in this life all come down on some level to sin, I believe that's the case. If that's true... That's just yet another reason we look forward to heaven. We don't deal with that possibility of sin. Here we do. So we need an advocate. Now, I think you're convinced. You're doing pretty good, right? Well, some of you are still struggling. So let's just go through the Ten Commandments. Now, by the end of the Old Testament, there were about 13,000 different laws that you had to worry about trying to obey. But let's just start with the Ten Commandments and see how we're doing, okay? Number one. Have you ever worshipped anything other than God? If that's you, raise your hand. Okay, some of you not being very honest, but uh, yeah. Here's what I figured out. I don't even make it past number one. I just don't. There are times in my life where, where my adoration, my focus, my attention has not been just to God. Okay, number two. Do you have any other gods? Raise your hand. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Some of you are going to go home and worship one of them this afternoon, watching the NFL, or you <laughs> worship some yesterday, or you got on your boat and you worshiped it, or whatever, the golf course. Okay, number three. Have you ever used God's name in vain? 
Well, let me just ask this one. Have you ever driven on I-4? Let me see your hand. Okay. All right. We didn't do good on that one. Yep. Keep the Sabbath? Well, I keep attendance, so I know we've got busy and some... Okay. Number five, honor your parents. Nope, we're still not doing good. Number six, maybe we'll catch a break here. Don't murder. Whoo, we finally found one we didn't do, except that Jesus rose the standard because we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus said, uh, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I say to you, if you've got anger in your heart and you've talked to people in the wrong way, well, we didn't do good there. Hmm. Number seven, don't commit adultery. Okay, we're doing good there, maybe. Okay, fine. Except that Jesus said, you've heard it said don't commit adultery, but I'm saying if you've just lusted in your heart, yeah. Number eight, don't steal. Oh, how about this one? You ever used anybody else's Netflix account? <laughs> there you go. Okay. See, you can't do that one either. No. And don't lie. Some of you are liars because you didn't raise your hand on number one. <laughs> number 10, don't covet. That's just wanting something that's not yours. All of us have done that. What I'm telling you is we are sinners. And when we sin, we need an advocate. advocate. We also need an advocate because there's an accuser. So the accuser is like the prosecuting attorney. And did you know the book of the Revelation says that Satan is the accuser of the of the saints, of the brethren. That's you and me as a follower of Christ. So we've got a, an accuser, so we need an advocate. Now, earlier this year, I needed an advocate. Most of our bills we just pay online, so I have to confess I don't always look at my mail, and sometimes that gets me in trouble. Because occasionally, you know, with the name that is used to describe this, you would think this is a gift, but I've discovered it's not a gift. I got in the mail something they called a ticket. And it, let's just say it, it placed a charge against me. And they felt like they knew that I was guilty just because in black and white they had a picture. But whatever. <laughs> so by the time I see this ticket, I, uh, it's been sitting there a while. And so it's got a price tag. So I'm calling and saying, hey, what's going on? I still need a license. And they said, well, you got to pay this. And I said, but it's kind of heavy. In other words, it's a lot of money. And they said, well, you can go to court. And I'm like, oh, really? And then the lady said, and believe me, you want to do that. It always gets better if you'll just go to court. I said, okay, hook me up. So they scheduled me a court date. And when we sat there, and there was a lot of us, apparently, that got those same tickets. We sat there, and the judge came out before we went into his court. And he said, now, listen. You just do what I'm going to say to do. You just tell me that you're guilty. Nobody's going to get points taken off their license. Everybody's going to get at least half price on the ticket. It's going to be easy. Let's just do this and get out of here. So I'm down. My name starts with P, so I'm down the list. And all these jokers get up, and none of them listen to him. They're like, innocent, your honor. And he's like, I told you, you're not innocent. <laughs> That's kind of my court experience. I, I didn't get any points, and I got a lot less on the ticket. Because when I was standing there, I said, well, officer, there's actually, I got two of these. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but some of you have been in a more serious setting with the judge. And you needed that advocate. And what the advocate does is, whether you're guilty or not, they're arguing your case before the judge or the jury. And then whether you're guilty or not, the judge or the jury is going to make a decision and then whether you're guilty or not, that advocate's going to get something from you. Because Morgan and Morgan don't have all those commercials because they do it just out of the gratitude of their heart. Right? Our advocate is different. Because we are guilty. We've already established that. And yet our advocate stands before the judge and declares us innocent. And then our advocate says, you get all the benefits. All I did was take your punishment. Jesus is your advocate. Do you hear that? Jesus is your advocate. Like the song we sometimes sing, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. 
So how does Jesus do that if we're guilty? <laughs> because a really good attorney might make somebody think you're not guilty, but we are guilty. It's because Jesus is not just our advocate. He's also our atoning sacrifice. Now some of your trans translations say that he is our propitiation. Say propitiation. A lot of times we don't talk like this in church, but here's the reality. If you can go to Starbucks and say, I need a triple venti soy milk, three pump, whatever, Tucci McKigley, then if you can figure that out, then you can figure out the word propitiation. What does the word propitiation mean? It simply means the payment that satisfies. So on the cross, the wrath of God that you deserved the punishment that you deserve. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin of death. The wrath of God, the punishment that you and I deserve was poured out on Jesus and that satisfied the payment. Now you need to understand this. This is a theological truth. Remember we're talking about what it means to be saved. What Jesus took on the cross satisfied everything God demanded in light of your sin. The ill will that you deserve is now replaced by goodwill from God. So I could read this morning in the Psalms, God is good and God does good. Through Jesus' death, it becomes possible for you to be, listen to this, at one with God. And in English, that word at one, when you put it together, it spells atone. Jesus atoned for your sin. Now in the Old Testament, that word atonement is, is very important because we see this system of sacrifices that demonstrates the atonement of God that God makes available. So when an animal, when their blood is shed and, 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 and that animal is sacrificed for your sins, you in the Old Testament, your sins were atoned for at least in that moment. Once a year, there would be this system where the priest could atone for the sins of the whole nation of Israel once a year. But every year, they would have to go back and do this again. This is also pictured in the sacrificial system when you think about uh, the Ark of the Covenant. You see, that all began to take place after the children of Israel were delivered out of slavery from Egypt. You remember what happened in that last plague that God sent? The angel of death that would take the lives of people of the children of Israel, but what, what did God instruct them to do so that they would be free from that punishment? The blood of a lamb would be placed on the doorpost and the angel of death would see the blood and pass over. So that kind of continued all throughout these sacrificial systems that God set forth. And ultimately it took place even as they constructed the Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant, on the top is the mercy seat. The mercy seat's a picture of Christ and his propitiation. The mercy seat is where the blood was sprinkled during the sacrifice of the atonement of sin. The mercy seat is wooden, covered in gold, signifying the humanity and the deity of Christ. It sits above the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant, you had Aaron's rod and you had the manna that God had given as provision. So it represents the humanity of the people. You had the cloud of God's glory that was above it. And the picture is the mercy seat sprinkled with the blood stands between God's perfect holy nature and our sinful helpless state. That's the propitiation of Christ. Jesus on the cross became the atoning sacrifice for you and he stood between God and you and me. And because of that, that becomes our pathway to peace. Jesus is the dying savior, but he's also the doing savior. He advocates for us. He atones for us. So how does this look in heaven? Jesus doesn't stand be before the Father and say, oh, come on, Father. Let's give Paul another chance. He blew it again. He, he means well. He's got good intentions. He's got a good heart. No. He stands before the Father and says, Father, forgive Paul because I lived a perfect life and then I took his punishment, though I didn't deserve it. So you, you can't touch Paul because I'm standing in between. 
Do you understand what a big deal that is? Church, if that's really the case, why should anything in this world rob me of peace? Jesus wasn't asking for mercy. Oh, come on, be merciful to Paul. No, he's asking for justice. Father God, is the right thing for you to forgive because the sin has already been paid for. I told you this is a one, two, three punch. One big idea. The peace of God only comes through peace with God, and it only comes through a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Two theological truths. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. Now, three everyday applications, and then we're done. Number one, Jesus gives you peace with your past. Remember, remember what happened with Ebenezer Scrooge? I mean, he, he has this dreams or whatever and, and have these ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. And because he changes the way he sees his past and his present and his future, he becomes more of a man of peace. And instead of being the, the person that nobody wants to be around, he becomes a likable guy. What if the way you looked at your past, present, and future could change your peace? So, number one, Jesus gives you peace with your past. We read this last week, but chapter 1 ends this way. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and will forgive your sins and purify you from all unrighteousness. If scripture is true, if you're a follower of Christ, your past has been dealt with. Thanks to Jesus, you should be free from guilt. Why? You're no longer guilty. Why? Because your advocate stood in your place. He took your punishment and you've been declared righteous. Psalms 103 says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Say removed. If he's removed it, that means it's not there. And if it's not there, then you don't need to be guilty. Your guilt has been removed. It's not on your record. Somebody can't go in and look it up. Jesus the Christ has removed it from you. And that means not only thanks to Jesus are you free from guilt, but thanks to Jesus you're free from shame. Jesus did not come to shame us for our sin. That's where the distinction has to lie. Yes, we're going to be a place that talks about the call to repent of sin. But this is not a place to shame of sin. That's not what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to shame us for our sin. He came to save us from our sin. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. And remembers your sins no more. If you've confessed your sin, he was faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And so if you are holding on to something you've confessed and been forgiving of, you're remembering something that the Bible says God can't even remember. Do you follow? He remembers it no more. Thanks to Jesus... You can have peace with your past. But here's what I've learned journeying through life. A lot of people are struggling in the moment. And, and so the second thing I see in this passage is that Jesus grants us peace with our present. Yeah, he can give you peace with your past, but he can also grant you peace in your present. Sin robs us of peace in so many ways. A few weeks, we'll get back to the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll read these words of Jesus. Listen. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or, or about your body, what you wear. Is, is not life more than food or the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or, or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And yet we are filled with stress and anxiety and worry. And man, even scientists tell us 90% of what we worry about never happens. That's why Jesus, when he was leaving, would say, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. I think what we begin to understand when we look at our advocate and we see our atoning sacrifice is that we live our lives as a direct reflection of who is living in us. So if you're consumed with self, if you're in charge of everything in your life and you're a control freak and you've got to make sure you're, you're the one and it's all about you, guess what? You're going to live your life consumed with you. But if you make the decision that I'm surrendering control of my life and Jesus is the number one thing to me, then how you experience life will be a direct reflection of the one living in you. That's why Paul would say, and what are some verses that you should commit to memory? Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your request, present your request to God. And the peace of God, I learned it this way, which surpasses all understanding, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. How? Through Christ Jesus. You want the peace of God to guard your heart and mind? Because that's where we lose peace. In our mind and in our heart. You want the peace of God to guard your heart and mind? That's only found as you just trust Him in the present every day. Jesus gives you peace with your past. Jesus grants you peace in your present. But Jesus also guarantees peace in your future. Now, I can't tell you how excited I am about next week because we're going to talk about this a little bit. So I'm just going to give you a hint of where we're headed. And I'm going to do it by reading a verse in 2 Corinthians 4. Listen to what it says in verse 16. Therefore, do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. <laughs> Anybody else feel like you're outwardly wasting away? <laughs> Every Sunday I pray with some men in our church before I come out for the first service. This morning, there were about six of us in there, and we're all down on our knees, and all of us pray, and I'm always the last one to pray, and by the time I said amen, I mean, it was all kind of noise as everybody started to stand up. Oh, ooh, I mean, your bones cracking. I mean, we are outwardly wasting away, yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Why? For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's what's going on. C.S. Lewis would call this the weight of glory. He's saying, you feel like your circumstances, the things around you are hard. Don't focus on that. Focus on the weight of glory. Because remember, there's coming a day where sin won't even be possible. And if you can imagine a place where there's no sin and there's only God, man, that's a good place. That's the pathway to peace. So let me take you back to that song I heard Cassie singing. It ends this way. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and, and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin in me. Oh, Christ follower. That's been my prayer for you for our time together today. Let this be the moment. Let this be the moment where you determine, regardless of the circumstances of life, I'm going to experience the peace of God. And if you've not made peace with God, let this be the moment where you understand that He can give you peace. Peace of God is only possible through the peace with God. And that's only possible through a right relationship with Jesus. Do you have that right relationship? It's 1987. By the way, I was graduating from high school. This rock band was storming the world. You too. Their lead singer would profess to be a follower of Christ. And he'd write a song that you heard if you were there in the 80s, or you like the 80s music, or perhaps if you saw the movie Sing 2 and heard this from The Lion. It's called I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. 
He said this is actually a gospel-based song with a restless spirit. And maybe in your search for peace, you can relate to the words of this song. But I don't want you to end where they ended. I want you to see what it can be. So let me just remind you of their words. I have climbed the highest mountains. I have run through the fields only to be with you. Only to be with you. I have run. I have crawled. I have scaled these city walls. These city walls. Only to be with you. Only to be with you. And then, you know how it, how it went. Then they sang. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. So what do we do? So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing that again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Would you just reverently stand and bow your heads with me? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We're going to sing in response to what God's doing in our life. A song of declaration. We're singing... Everything's okay. It's well with my soul. But I don't want you to sing that if it's not well with your soul. If you're not at peace, if you don't have the peace of God, there's some things you need to do. So if you're a Christ follower, and today you're not walking in peace, you're not walking in the peace of God, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Just do whatever it takes to spend time with Him in this moment and say, I want to get this right. So that may mean just coming kneeling here at the front of this room. It may mean taking the hand of one of our pastors that will be standing here. Maybe you're there in your seat just sitting back down and saying, God, I, I, need, I need to live with peace and I've not been living with peace. But somebody's here and you've never begun a relationship with Christ. I want to challenge you today. This is kind of one of the tensions in our faith. Beginning that relationship with Christ is simple as saying a prayer. But there's a lot of people that have said a prayer and meant nothing. <laughs> and nothing's ever changed. And they've never had peace because there's never been repentance. So if you're ready to take that step and follow Christ, there's no magic prayer. You don't have to use my words. But I want to facilitate that if that's where you are. So maybe you would just cry out to God and you would just say, Oh God, I need you. Just you and him right now. Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. Just acknowledge that. I'm a sinner that needs to be saved. I want to be at peace with God. And then pray this. Say, Jesus, I believe you are my atoning sacrifice. You endured the wrath of God so that I could be declared righteous. So today I turn to you, repenting of my sin. following you. And then even those of us who are Christians might join in the last part of this prayer. Lord, unfortunately we know we'll fail you again. But we know, Jesus, you're our advocate. Thank you for standing in our behalf before the Father. So our 
our heads are bowed, but as we sing this song in a moment, if there's a spiritual need, maybe you prayed that prayer, you began a relationship with Christ. I want to share that with someone. There'll be pastors from our church standing here. I'm going to invite you to come. Maybe you want to come and pray. I'm going to invite you to come. Maybe you just want to stand and worship. This is our response. Lord Jesus, in response to all that you are, we declare it is well with our soul. In Jesus' name.